Live 8 Squadron is part of a series of dives that I've done over the years. And we, um, there was a book when I lived in Cambridge that I borrowed from the library, which was entitled British Admiralty Disasters at Sea. And certainly some of those wrecks stuck in my mind. And I visited a few of them, those in sort of diveable depths. Um, I uh, used to dive for said in the South China Seas with uh, Jack Ingle. Was privileged to join Mike Rowley's visit to HMX Victoria um, and was coerced into doing um, Pathfinder by Jay Maddox. So let's move on to Live Bait Squadron. Uh, we're going to talk about the ships. The U-boat that caused them so many casualties. The U-boat commander entitled the attack three before breakfast, because as you'll see, he sank, sank three major British ships before he went and had his breakfast. So it was an, obviously an early morning attack. And a little bit about the diving. So ships that we're talking about is HMS Abu Kair, HMS Cressy and HMS Hogue. These were Cressy class cruisers. There were total and a little bit about them. They were completed at the century, so 1901, 1902. Um, thousand tons. I'm going Imperial here, 472. 70 foot beam and 27 foot draft, so quite ships. Each ship had a complement of, of between 725 and 760. So, as you can see, major, major casualties. Propulsion uh, was 21,000 indicated horsepower from uh, uh, triple expansion steam engines. Um, and this was the steam was provided by 30 Belleville boilers. Not going to go into the intricacies of boilers, although some uh, people enjoy that sort of thing. She had two Anders triple expansion steam engines. And as you can see, uh, low pressure first, medium pressure, and higher pressure. Obviously, um, the, the lower the pressure, the big, bigger the volume and the bigger displacement. So um, we're not talking about massive pressure here, just a, a few PSI. So directly drives the screw via two shafts and maximum speed of 21 knots. So for the turn of the century, that's not bad. Uh, armament were two single 9.2 inch breech loaders. 12 single breech loaders, six inches. 12 single quick firing, 12 pounders. Three three pounder Hotchkiss guns. And we'll go a little bit deeper into the Hotchkiss guns in a talk about U9. And a couple of torpedo tubes. Eight. So this is how her armament was. Obviously, the major guns on the foredeck and at the um, wrong way around, sorry, at the foredeck and at the stern. Lots of 12 pounders scattered around, and midships, all the six inch quick firers and some of the other guns. So, pretty well armored, although, in terms of the size of the armament, isn't that great so the range wasn't so even though they were 12 13 14 years old they were a bit antiquated at the beginning of world war one so they had been put into the reserve fleet or used for training purposes they were capital ships at the time however war they were hastily recommissioned and obviously they couldn't find as many RN people as they needed so most of the crew were reservists 
but with a few RN ratings. Um, within those reservists were Coast Guard officers and naval cadets, which means there were um, several youngsters within the crews. So in total, there was more than 2,000 sailors on the boats. Their main task was to patrol the Southern North Sea. This area was known as the Broad Four Teams, uh, mainly because of the depths of the water. 14 fathoms is about 19 foot. So um, the area was known as the Broad Four Teams. They were also tentatively named, nicknamed the Live Bait Squadron. Now there is um, a, a theory that they were Live Bait to lure out German forces. Whether that's true, I don't think we will ever know. So September 20th, 1914, not long after the outbreak of World War One, their main base was Harwich and they were sent out to patrol the Broad Four Teams. Unfortunately, the weather was too rough for destroyer escorts. So the three ships were sent out alone. By that time, seen as obsolete, unwieldy, badly armed, badly armed, sorry, and poorly armoured. Let's look at the SMU-9, which is the German sub. She was launched 1910, 57 metres, 6 metres by 3 and 611 ton when submerged. And there is a picture of her. It, this was a day is where to vent exhaust fumes, they had to manually um, bring up a, uh, a stack. Um, no such things as the snorkels that became later. She was powered by two courting eight cylinder engines. Uh, I'm assuming the two six cylinder engines ran the compressors. However, she had a surface speed of 14.2 knots. When submerged, she used two electric and could manage 8.1 knots. She had a cruising range of 1,800 nautical miles and a diving depth of 50 meters. So all in all, quite a formidable boat um, for that early in the war. Her armament was only four 20 inch torpedo tubes and six torpedoes. So they'd got the hull design right and the power, um, but they didn't have the storage capacity for more than six torpedoes. So it was a, again a machine gun on the deck and a 1.5 inch Hotchkiss gun. She was quick firing with five barrels much like the old Gatling gun you see in some of the uh, old movies. The Hotchkiss gun was originally a carriage gun and was adapted or modified for use at sea. So in charge was Captain Lieutenant Otto Witt and there were four officers and 31 enlisted sailors. So for a 60 meter ship, um, that's quite a few people. She was a first submarine to reload was underwater. Up to then, submarines had to come and manhandle the, uh, the torpedoes um, across the deck and move them into their torpedo tubes. Um, but she was the first one to reload underwater, and it was pertinent to this attack. So on the 21st of September 1914, she was patrolling the Broad 14s. Uh, it was very rough, as we said before, so she laid on the bottom all night so she doesn't think about and, and has to uh, think about uh, uh, rolling and pitching. However, the storm abated overnight, and this will have a little bit of a impetus later uh, in that there were other vessels around and she surfaced early about 6 a.m to find 
three cruisers and the captain couldn't believe his luck so at 625 he uh, lined up and fired the first torpedo the fleet um, at this time was steering north northeast at seven knots they had been told to, to zigzag at speed about 13 knots um, to avoid sort of torpedoes but at that the admiralty didn't think to, um, submarines were a great threat and more thought more that mines were a problem so again this helped her, helped their demise so hm abaker was the first target and he fired a single you know, the ship keeled over captain thought he had been mined because of the admiralty orders and ordered the other ships to assist this meant that they had to slow down more and even become static it took quite a while before he finally realized he'd been torpedo and therefore he ordered the other ships away uh, the Avacair turned upside down and sank at 0650. So a total of about 25 minutes between the first hit and her sinking. U9 then fired two torpedoes at HMS Hogue and hit her amidships from 300 metres. Um, Hogue was still relatively static, so it was a real easy target. The torpedo hit the ammunition store with a massive explosion. This rapidly flooded her engine room and she sank within 10 minutes. On SMU on U9, the trim was upset by firing the two torpedoes. So the U boat rose to the surface for a short, short while until they got it under control. During that time, Cressy fired on her without any effect. HMS Cressy was still static at this time. By 7.15, the submarine was all tooled up again and she fired two torpedoes at Cressy. One missed and one hit the starboard side. The one that hit was not a fatal wound. So he turned to use the stern torpedoes and hit the munition store and she sank within 15 minutes. Now this is interesting, this uh, graphic, because it shows you the track of uh, SMU-9 and also of the trip, the, the, the ships. As you can see, they were steaming in northeast. So U9 approaches, fires torpedo at Abu Kir here, turns around, gets off a couple of torpedoes at Hogue, and then moves on to Cressy and fires a couple of to distant torpedoes and then one close in for the final kill. One could say, they were easy targets um, because they were really going slowly, not zig zigzagging, weren't expecting a submarine attack. Unfortunately, nearly 1,500 men died. However, there were survivors. If you look at that total, that is more people died within this tragedy than died on the Titanic. Because the weather had uh, moderated, there were trawlers out from Holland and they picked up survivors and landed them at Wymudum. A bit wordy, but um, there was some repercussions. Um, patrol by army cruisers was a bad you were not allowed to stop major ships in dangerous waters and 
that ships, any ships were ordered to stream at 30 knot, 13 knots and zigzag. Fear Admiralty, they liked somebody to blame um, and they the senior officers. And Captain Drummond, senior captain, um, was involved by saying, you weren't zigzagging and you didn't call for the destroyers. The fact that they were to get out of port and they wouldn't have got there in time was uh, not seen as relevant. If anybody wants to know more about Live Bait, there is a Live Bait Society. That's run by a, an elderly um, Dutch gentleman called Hank van Lieden. Um, he was 90 the last time I had contact with him. So hopefully he has survived. Um, I just don't know. However, I was sent from involved parties once the, the news got out that there had been a commemoration um, at the historic dockyard in Chatham, a hundred years, years at the anniversary of the sinking. And I, I was sent this program and still have that. So 2013, we'd finished the Pathfinder project and I was looking for something more to do. Um, decided live bait would be a good thing to do um, and looked for a leaderboard to go to Dutch waters. However, they were none available that were working these waters. So I contacted the European Overseas Officer, Bart, who I believe is on this call and a friend of mine, and asked him to do some digging and find me some resources. So I needed a boat, some gas and accommodation. Um, a boat and accommodation into a liverboard would be good. Let's think about the position of X. Um, so uh, most ports of Holland are here. To the north of those is a port called Chevin again. Excuse me. Can't really pronounce, it, but uh, I'm sure Bart could put us right. And the ships are 22 miles offshore in the Broad 14s. As you can see, loads and loads of loads of wrecks. We were just interested in these three. Bart came up with a boat called Aquila, which is Dutch for um, uh, British built trawler um, converted with a few problems, shall we say. Um, one of the problems was this great big deck crane, which took up a lot of room. Another problem was the forward slope on the bow, which continued on the floor of the vessel. So um, made difficult to move around. So she was a converted Lowestoft steel trawler based at Sheveningham, 20 metres, 6 metres by 3 metres, advertised as sleeping 12. Um, yes, you could get 12 people in there. Um, four people had to share the same bed in places, and uh, the, the, the rooms were tiny, tiny. However, she did have a double-filtered compressor, which meant that we could take her own oxygen and mix nitro those who wanted it. Um, talked about the accommodation. Um, the accommodation was so small that you had to get out of the cabin into the alleyway to get changed. It was that cramped. Um, so she had been converted primarily as um, accommodation for his uh, captain and his wife, and I think the secondary. We talked about the deck layout, the high ab, and the slant on the deck. That that made things a bit uh, of a struggle, especially with heavy kit. I did have a nice platform on the foredeck, which, when it was calm, we could have. Um, a drink and a recount of the day's tales and a plan of what 
the next day. Uh, diving protocol was a little bit different to what we're used to in the UK. Um, Captain and his was obviously steering the bow, but on board there were two guides, and I tentatively call them guides. I think they're a bit, um, bit better divers than the guides you find on some of the Red Sea wrecks. Um, they were certainly used to North Sea waters, um, and they were members of the Dutch Association. But the idea is we don't do anything. They jump in and tie the shot into the wreck. We jump on command, a little bit more about that. Obviously go down the shot line, but the skipper wanted everybody to ascend the shot line. And I don't know how many of you have spent time decompressing on a shot line with 11 under pe other people. It becomes a bit of a problem unless you've got a John line. Soon as you surfaced, you were told to hang on to the buoy. Um, obviously, we weren't diving in too much of a current, so that wasn't a problem. And you waited for the boat to come towards you and the current to carry you to the boat. And then you ladder, which was a vertical ladder so you could climb with your fins where you expected at the top some decent handholds, there were two bits of rope. And the boat was rolling, made it a bit disconcerting. So to me, that wasn't great. The guides then jump in again and remove the shot. They untie it. Um, so it's not very mechanised and sort of heavy on people. Excuse me, I'll have a water. Um, so let's think about the project. The area here was about the best place to kit up because it was on the flat and um, easy to get into your kit. Further up you went, the more you got in by the crane and the more of a slope. So the guys here, guys and girls who were kitting up here, really had to wait to assist those um, on the higher bits that were impeded by the crane. We had some very experienced divers on board and some of them were more experienced than the guide, which led to a bit of frivolity, um, just a little bit of give and take. We were not allowed to ascend under DSMBs. So again, different protocol from us. And they really didn't like us doing deep. Um, we bent the rules a little one on that because uh, 35 meters, even if you're on nitrox, you don't get a great deal of time. And I mentioned about the kitting and de-kitting on the slope. We've talked about the entry and the exit. So let's think about this. Hopefully the video is going to kick off. As you see, you've got to walk from the bunt front of the boat to a midships or a bit further, having been kitted up. And rumour has it, this is Mike Rowley at the back, rumour has it that Mike was six foot two before this event. No doubt he'll ring me later to berate me. But having walked there, you've got to stand late until the skipper manoeuvres into position which can take five minutes. So I know when I'm kitted with a rebreather and a stage, I've got 60 kilograms on my back, so it's more comfortable. So again, we have to line off. We weren't expecting to do this, so not many people had bottom lines. So we had to use what was available, which might cause a little bit of money in a minute. So as we said before, you send the shot line and you wait for this lumbering 70 tonne boat to get near you, it blows the horn and you come off. And descent, ascent is at the shot bar. No bagging. 
So we did have a commemoration was um, one of our divers, Carol, who was diving with us, was at a dinner one night with a couple of her friends, and she found out that her goddaughter's great great grandfather had died on the wrecks. Um, she decided that she would like to uh, lay a wreath. Henry King was rescued from the Abu Kir, picked up by the Hoag, and was died when the Hoag was sunk. So quite a bit of tragedy there. So Carol took it on herself to lay a wreath on the wreck to commemorate the loss of Henry King. So British Admiralty being what it was, after the Second World War, it sold salvage rights to of all, com uh, all countries, a German salvage firm. So in 1954, there was lawful salvaging, which involved the use of explosives. This uh, was then, uh, the, the salvage rights were then passed on to a Dutch company and they started salvage. However, the news got out and there was quite a bit of press about it. And finally, on 23rd of March 2017, the wrecks were protected under the Military Remains Act 1986. Bart um, put together a project plan and key things we wanted to do was to, obviously to dive the wrecks, commemorate the loss of life uh, under the, underneath the waves, which was an NAS um, initiative. We needed to do some training to get to the standard. Um, and because Grant had made this project plan, we applied for an expedition grant. So prior to the event, um, Carol was a sports diver with not a lot of experience of decompression. So we moved her forward through the buoyancy workshops to ADP. We got some of her stuff towards dive leader and got some workup dives. During the event, we were blending nitrox. So that was a good training initiative. Some people who were able to get advanced divers signed off or some of the dives for advanced divers signed off. And Jane and I ran an advanced instructor exam and uh, that was quite successful. We have an expedition grant and were awarded 250 pound. After consulting with all those involved, um, I donated the money to St Ab's lifeboat because uh, uh, that seemed a more worthwhile cause than uh, me and go down the pub. When we were, obviously the wrecks had been well salvaged, so they were broken. The use of explosives doesn't leave many uh, good bits about. They lay on a clean sand bottom, hence there was reasonable visibility for the North Sea. Six to eight metres is really good. Depth was 35 meters, so that was within a sport diver range, which was good. And the wrecks were spread over two sites the Abu Kir was separate, and the Hogan was somewhat intermingled. Some of the diving was interrupted by gales. I remember the first morning we got up and left port at 5 a.m. We got to the dive site, which took three hours, and we got an imminent gale warning. So we turned around and came back. Uh, later in the week, um, or, or the very next day, we did a 6 a.m. start and, and got to Rex and dive them. A couple of days later, Again, we got kitted up, ready to dive, and an imminent gale warning came in. It took us five hours in a rolling sea, southerly gale, so um, rolling all over the place. 
So a little bit about the diving. Obviously the wreck um, has lots of munitions and this is cordite, which is used as a propellant for the shell. Plenty of fish life. When you find something like this on a wreck, I don't honestly know whether that was from one of the casualties, but it just makes you stop and think about where you are and what you're doing. And cases for the cordite and obviously the shell cases that the cordite lives in. So we managed to have a couple of incidents. And I'm going to get killed for this. Um, because we were using reels uh, that weren't meant for the, for the job. Often we lost line off the spools or a plate came off. In fact, that's worth seeing again. And NI in trouble. The next incident in the ship itself, if you look, it's very well set out, but it has ornaments sitting at high level. And during the second trip back from the second gale, um, we had a problem with one of these ornaments. The boat name, if you remember, was Aquila or Eagle. And on the top, of one of these shells was a wooden um, eagle. Um, however, this eagle decided to take off on one spectacular roll. Um, fortunately, somebody was in the way to break its foot. And uh, no, well, no Mike Rowleys were harmed in this incident, but the, the eagle certainly suffered a broken wing. Another phone call I'm going to get at the end of this. So let's talk about the team. Obviously, we had 12. They came from seven different BSIC branches. And we were uh, had an abundance of skill. We had people from sports diver up to national instructor. And the kit we were using, four rebreathers, seven twin sets. Carol, being petite, didn't use a lot of gas. So she had a and a pony and use that for accelerated deco. So this is second in a series of trips. Um, 2004 spoke about, we did HMS Pathfinder. With then 15 was Live Bait Squadron. And in 2016, we did HMS and Koenig and Louise. These were the first two ships sunk in World War One. Um, they lay 44 miles off. Um, talked to Mark last night and possible that we may do a little show on these at the end of this year. Hopefully we will get some good diving before then. I intend getting out there this year.